Angie and Lynn, I'd like to welcome you to WMNF's Tuesday Cafe. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Thank you, Sean. Thanks for having us. Yeah. The first thing I want to do is ask Lynn, why did you make the film Medicating Normal? Uh, I had a, I had a, a family member who uh, was struggling with mental illness or what was, what was diagnosed as mental illness in her 20s. And um, it, it sort of, uh, she was a sort of star athlete um, at a very competitive college. Um, she uh, was put on a medication and in about six to eight years time, that medication turned into 10 medications. And um, it didn't appear that she was getting any better. Um, in fact, there was a you know, marked decline in um, you know, her health. Um, so uh, she, she'd call me every day on the phone, Linny, is everything gonna be okay? You know, very supportive family. And um, we, uh, we would always reassure her. I, I think I, I originally thought, well, her, her, is her fear financial? No, we're all gonna pitch in and support her. Um, because of course, at that point, she was unable to, to hold down a job. But I think what, her, what it dawned on me, and I can't remember exactly when, you know, her, she, was, she was questioning and her angst had to do with her own functioning. Am I going to be able to function? She had been, she's an incredible writer and you know, had dreams of becoming a famous writer and would, would she ever be able to realize her dreams? And I think that was what was upsetting her most. Um, so I began at that point um, just to, to start to read about the drugs she was taking. Um, they were antidepressants, antipsychotics, uh, benzodiazepines, and um, trying to learn a little bit about what, what they were being prescribed for, how they worked. Um, there was very little information out there about how they interacted with each other, and she was on 10 meds. So um, what I began to learn, the first book that my filmmaking partner and I read was called Anatomy of an Epidemic by Robert Whitaker, and it just uncovered a, a really... Uh, new perspective on all of this that um, I just, I felt we had to make a film. We're going to get to Angie, Angie in just a second, but when you mentioned that you're, that about ten, being on 10 pills at a time, that reminds me of one of the opening scenes of the film where a, a Navy veteran has a suitcase full of medicines. I mean, there must be 20 different medications in there in a suitcase, and it just kind of really struck home um, how over, over medicated it's probably, you know, easy for me to say, but it seemed very, um, very likely that this person was being over medicated with about 20 prescriptions. Yes, and uh, Angie will talk about her her experience, but that 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 scene was Dave Cope, who was um, an MIT graduate, a rising star in the Navy, extremely capable. Um, uh, went in, I think, uh, in graduate school, went in to complain about a bit of test anxiety and and perhaps a broken heart. He'd had a, a failed relationship, and what started with him is two medications ended up just constantly changing. And An Angie describes it the best in the film as, as just this one drug leading to another, not working, leading to another and another. And it just, it's, it's random and it's reckless. And that we hope, we're glad you noticed that scene because we felt that was a strong way to start the film. I want to remind people that you're listening to WMNF's Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. My guest, Lynn Cunningham, a filmmaker and director and producer of Medicating Normal. And right now we're going to turn to Angie Peacock. She's a mental health advocate and a decorated former Army sergeant. Uh, you're featured prominently in the documentary, Angie. Tell our audience as much as you can about your history, when you were in the Army, when you were prescribed medications, and what you're up to now. Well, I... Um... I joined the army at 18. I'm from St. Louis, Missouri, originally. Um, part of the reason was patriotic because my two of my family members, my grandparents served in World War II. The other part was, you know, lack of access to college and there was a college fund in the army. And so I knew I, I, it was a ticket to adventure and meaning and patriotism and college. So I joined the army and then uh, pretty quickly, I went to Iraq in 2003. I deployed um, right at the beginning of the war. Things were extremely hard, you know, lack of supply lines, lack of water, very um, environmentally hazardous. Um, I got sick pretty quickly. 
And then after six months, I was medically evacuated out. The day after my medical evacu evacuation, my convoy was hit and one of my soldiers came back to the same exact hospital that I had just come back to in Germany, wounded um, in surgery. Long story short, he came out of surgery. I saw the wounds and he told me the story of what happened. And it was just in that moment, I couldn't, I couldn't hold all the trauma that I had experienced anymore. And I, the only thing I knew was to just say politely, I got to go. I can't, I can't hear anymore. And I walked out th down the hallway and I saw a big sign on the wall that said psychiatry. And I thought, you know, that's where, that's where you go when you need help and you're emotional. So I very quickly was prescribed one drug and it was uh, clonazepam, which is an anti-anxiety drug. And then it quickly turned into, here's an antidepressant. Here's a sleep medication. Now I'm getting headaches. Um, very quickly, I started getting worse. And they, they told me those symptoms are post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, do I deny that I had post-traumatic stress of some kind? Of course I did. I mean, if, if you don't leave a war zone and it affects you, then I would say there's something wrong with you for sure because it affects you, <laughs> you know. But um, part of it, I think, was an adverse reaction to the, to the drug. And I was having severe side effects immediately. But that led to 13 years of medications, over 45 psychiatric drugs, seven hospitalizations. I lost my army career. I lost my marriage. I lost my femininity, my sexuality, everything. I just became a mental health patient. And that's what my life revolved around medications and going to doctors and therapists. And um, just some little voice inside of me was like, why aren't you feeling better? Why, what, what are, what's your baseline? Um, why don't you feel joy? Why don't you feel part of life anymore? Like what happened? Um, and I just started, I, I got lucky. I had a psychiatrist that was pretty decent. And he said, let's start taking you off of some of this stuff. Um, that led to, you know, I didn't have a goal in mind. Like I need to get off all the meds. That wasn't even a goal. It just, at a certain point, they just started like it backfired. Um, I started just like getting really strange symptoms, um, pain, all kinds of weird things. And I didn't really even know it was the meds. But I got off of everything um, six years ago, this month actually, and uh, the filmmakers found me in one of the support groups for people that are coming off meds without medical help because medical professionals don't really even know how to take people off of these medications, which was really startling for me to learn in this journey. And um, basically they followed me for three years. They showed the process of me coming off and like coming to terms of what happened to me by trusting this mental health care system and thinking that they had my best intention at heart. And um, I don't know, here I am six years later, I travel the country in my camper van. We talk about these issues wherever, wherever we can. We've had screenings all over the world. We've interviewed most amazing people that have come through this, experts, all kinds of things. And I do that all from my camper van. <laughs> right now I'm in Arizona, yeah. And that's Angie Peacock. She's a mental health advocate and decorated former art, army sergeant. She's one of the subjects featured in the film Medicating Normal. It's a new documentary produced and directed in part by Lynn Cunningham. You're listening to WMNS Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. So I guess Lynn or Angie, whoever would like to answer this, I mean, it, it comes down to the main question. Are Americans being overprescribed common psychiatric medications like sleeping pills and anti-anxiety meds? Do you think that you got to an answer to that question in your film? Yes, definitely. And I think that that isn't even there. There is no one out there that wouldn't agree with us. Um, uh, there is there is over prescribing. And the reason we chose the, the, the title for the film Medicating Normal is that um, it's not only over prescribing in the amount of meds and then the meds that are given to treat side effects from meds. It's over prescribing for basic human issues human um, sadnesses, human losses, human challenges and stress that, that are um, you know, in large part a normal part of what it means to be human. And um, there are instances of course where people need to be on medication and it, it, screening the film across the country, people say, well, this medication saved my life. And, we have no issue with that. There are times when, you know, you must uh, reach out for medication, but it's the sort of rampant and reckless, just go to quick fix use of this medication um, without true understanding of the long-term harm that could occur, not always. And that's what's so difficult, difficult about telling the story is that not everybody's harmed, but a significant number 
Um, I think David David Cohen in the film estimates it's 30, 30, 30 to 35% of people who are put on these drugs um, experience um, great harm. That's not to say that there aren't those who experience help, but Getting to the point of medicating normal, and you were talking about, well, you know, a lot of people feel hurt and pain during their lives, and they just, kind of, you know, that's that's a kind of a normal part of life. You had an army doctor in the film comparing PTSD to a, a grief process, so it's something that that you know definitely has to be worked out. Will take time, and maybe in some cases, medication uh, might not necessarily, as at least as a long term solution, be the solution for the problem. Angie, any thoughts on that? Yes, I definitely think coming home from war, there is this process of grief um, that occurs. There's also, it's just like a, a hypervigilance when you're in a war zone. And for people listening, this is, this, this is the same if you're a victim of child abuse, if you're a victim of domestic violence, um, workplace violence, racism. It's, ve it's very similar that you just have to be on guard always. You have to be looking out for danger. And unfortunately, our bodies just don't unlearn that very quickly. It's like you learn to keep your body safe and you're doing everything you can. And some of it's unconscious, but we've evolved, you know, through millions of years to adapt and survive. And that's what we do. So to call that a disorder when I, and then medicate it is just a, it gives us it's a great disservice to a healing process. You know, and I, I like to say I kicked the can down the road because I took all those medications, but then when I came off, all the grief and all the trauma is still there. And now I have more trauma from the system, you know? So now I have to do therapy again, but this time without medication. And I have to learn ways to cope that I should have done back then, you know? So did it help me in the long run? No, it hurt. It really messed up my life. And, um, but I would have said six years ago that this medicine saves my life and I have to take it. And it, but things change. You just never know what's going to happen, you know, in the future. That's Angie Peacock. She's a mental health advocate. She's a decorated former army sergeant and one of the subjects of the film Medicating Normal. We also have the documentary's director and producer, Lynn Cuttingham, with us here on Tuesday Cafe from WMNF. I'm Sean Canan. So since we are talking about these uh, psychiatric medications, maybe it's a good point right now to, to uh, introduce those to people. If you're not, if people aren't familiar with what these psychiatric medications are, is that the same as psychoactive drugs? And what are some common examples that people might have heard of? Uh, <clears throat> they are antidepressants. They are anti-anxieties, which are known as a class of drugs called benzodiazepines. Um, they are sleeping pills. They are stimulants. Um, they are even antipsychotics. And um, um, one thing is very, very true is that people react and respond differently um, to these medications. And um, but they are very, very commonly prescribed for off-label, which means not even for the disorder that they are meant to be helping. The doctors, pres GPs prescribe them for many, many different reasons, menopause. Um, so uh, those, are the, those are the drugs. And some examples would be like Prozac, Wilbutrin, Effexor, um, Adderall. Uh, Xanax is a very commonly prescribed, especially during the pandemic. The prescribing rates have gone up for, for those. So like Prozac, Zac, um, Selexa, Lexapro, commonly prescribed. Zoloft. And some of these, as you mentioned earlier, work well short term. But what about long term use of these medications? Could they be making the mental health of people even worse? That is why we made the film. Um, we want we want people to, before they start to take these medications find out about the potential long-term harm. And we want them to know enough to be able to talk to their doctor about what we call an exit plan. And an exit plan means, okay, this may help me in the short term, maybe it won't, but maybe it will, and that's good. But what is your plan, doctor, about when I get off of these drugs? Um, because what we're seeing out there, and when Wendy and I did research, the pattern exists over and over and over again hundreds of people are almost parked on these drugs. And of course, drugs added to the drugs. Um, uh, what, what, what we're seeing is a lifetime. Um, there's no exit plan. So um, yes, there, we, are, we are over medicating ourselves. 
And part of that in that you display in the film, of course, and that we talked a little bit about earlier is when all these, when these meds are combined, there are interactions between some of them. So how is this related to the concept of polypharmacy? Angie, do you want to take that one? Sure, on? sure. So we, right now, drugs are studied only in short trials. There might be eight to 12 weeks. The trials are also very sterilized. So it's not people that are like actively suicidal, active with addiction, severe cases of post-traumatic stress. You know, they're very manageable patients that are in these trials. So if, if we're only measuring them short term, we don't know what happens when somebody's on them five or 10 years, for, for, for one example. We also don't know what happens when you combine them. And for, we just had a, we just had an expert on our, um, you, our YouTube channel just two days ago. And she said, if you're prescribed any more than two drugs, the likelihood of side effects goes up exponentially. So, but we, but what we find commonly in people we talk to doing the screenings, it's not just two, it's usually like five or three or four. So we even, we know even less about long-term and in a polypharmacy situation where you're on more than one drug. And that's really the scary part. And um, we we always say, please go read your pamphlet, talk to your pharmacist, because they often know more about the drugs that you're prescribed and the drug interactions than your doctor. That's Angie Peacock, a mental health advocate and a decorated former army sergeant. She's part of the, the documentary Medicating Normal. We have one of the directors and producers on as well, Lynn Cunningham. What do we know about uh, how many Iraq and Afghanistan war veterans who perhaps have had PTSD, how many of them are taking antidepressants, anti-anxiety medications, or sleeping pills? A lot. I would just say a lot. Um, I did a fellowship with the VFW in 2019, and it was very interesting for me to find out that they're not even really tracking how many veterans, you know, veteran suicide attempts are in relation to the amount of medications they're put on. But I did so much research, and what I found was it said that a post 9-11 veteran that has uh, post-traumatic stress disorder and is exposed to a benzodiazepine, which would be like Xanax or Ativan, has a 2.5 times greater risk of um, completing suicide. To me, that was absolutely shocking. Um, I also know that the 30-day prescription rate in the VA system is like through the roof. So these are like long-term benzo prescriptions when the VA itself knows that these that benzodiazepines are harmful and they have their own protocol for getting people off. So I think it's a serious problem in my generation, especially. And, and because we have such high access to healthcare, you know, we can go to the VA at any time and ask for help. But I, I just beg the question, like, what kind of help are we really receiving? Because I just know from my experience and from meeting other veterans, it's not helping us as much as, you know, we, we would hope. And that brings me to the question about the VA. Um, what did you find out in this film about the differences with how patients are treated when they're in the military versus how the Veterans Administration treats them when it comes to these, these psychiatric medicines? Um, I would say it's very similar because they, the VA and the DOD, Department of Defense, they all share the same protocol and the same treatment guidelines. So it, I would say it's similar but I would say I'd, I'd give VA some credit here because they have developed the whole health program recently where it's like access to other, other forms of care, like acupuncture, yoga classes, cooking classes. I get the emails all the time. So I think they recognize a problem. Maybe they're not coming out and saying it, but um, they're giving veterans other options. And it's partly because we've demanded them. You know, a lot of, a lot of the guys I know, they don't want to take a bunch of meds or they've taken them and they've experienced side effects. A lot of them have moved on to cannabis, which to me is like kind of scary because I don't think a drug is going to fix all the issues that we have, but some are looking at ketamine, you know? So there's, there's veterans out there looking for other options because they know this is just not helping them. Has the VA changed its guidelines on benzodiazepines uh, compared with a few years ago? Yeah, they have, but I still find it wanting. I, I went and followed all their citations back to see, like, where did they come up with this protocol to get people off? And I found that they're, they really did weigh heavy on the opiate deprescribing guidelines. And benzodiazepines like Xanax and Ativan are not the same as opiates. And oftentimes it's way too fast. It's not slow enough. It's not patient-centered. There's not an effort to talk to the veteran and say, like, you know, this medication is going to harm you in the long term. It's going to put you at higher risk for dementia and for falls when you get into your 60s. So what about now in your 40s? Can we can we slowly, slowly taper off maybe over a year, maybe over a year and a half? You know, what's the hurry? Um, often medical 
we'll leave you on for life. But when we ask for a slow taper, uh, you know, it's often like we're in a hurry. It shouldn't be a hurry. It should be a very slow approach. You know, if we can't get them, not put them on in the first place, take them off as slowly as needed so that they don't have these severe consequences like I did. That's the voice of Angie Peacock, the mental health, a mental health advocate. She's also a decorated former army sergeant. She's in the documentary Medicating Normal and the Director and producer Lynn Cunningham is with us as well. And Lynn, I wanted to ask you about um, the, this idea of with of of getting off of these medications and how it has to be done in a you know kind of a precise and slow way. And what about the symptoms of withdrawal that you noticed in in the subjects of your documentary? So <clears throat> the symptoms of withdrawal actually manifest as. Um, psychiatric disorders. I mean, there are many, many physical um, symptoms like brain zaps and things like that, but they're also- Wait a second, what's a brain zap? Sorry. Um, a brain zap is what is described as sort of a neurological electricity that is going on in your brain. And many, many people refer to it. Um, but they're also sort of emotional, psychological responses, fear, huge fear, um, um, insomnia, the inability to sleep, anxiety, heightened anxiety. So, I mean, the the panoply of withdrawal symptoms is so great that, um, yes, a big, big problem is that they're often misdiagnosed as another disorder. Um, and we're finding what Angie says is true about benzos in the VA, but we're also finding as we rolled the film out and screened it across the country and asked many, many doctors to take part in panels, that people's base knowledge about how to help a taper is, is completely across the board. It's random. Some people say, oh, cut the pill in half over, you know, cut it in a third, a third, a third. Other people are more aware and say, you know, 10% every two weeks. It, the range of how to taper is so great that it just, it just cannot, it, it, in it, that in and of itself is a story. Um, that no one seems to know, that it does not seem to be addressed in medical schools, um, or at least in any consistent way that, that we found. So um, yeah, withdrawal is a very big problem. And the point of tapering really gets hit home in your, in your study in two illustrations, in, in your film that is, in two illustrations. One is uh, there's, a, there's a woman in uh, the New York City area who literally has a scale and is just shaving her pills until she gets that exact uh, weight of the pill that she needs to for that day's taper, and another is the the Ar a Navy veteran that we talked about earlier, where he creates a, a, a chart for his wife with an exponential decline of her medication to to help her get off of her psych psychiatric medication. So uh, the precision and the the risks, I guess, that are involved in tapering really hit home with those examples. Yeah, and 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 on um, those are our characters did not know this when they first started on their journey with medication. They had no idea. They learned this. They learned by reading, by, by as Angie pointed out, um, taking part in the many, many, many um, support groups, internet support groups around the country. There's a lot of information out there. And um, uh, I know it's, it's somewhat threatening to doctors because th these are people helping other people through this. And, um, but often it's, it's information that is more accurate and helpful than what they would get in a doctor's office about it. And we just want to arm people with the right questions to be able to ask their doctors because the doctors need to go and inform themselves um, about this. But generally the slower you taper, the safer it is. And that's what, um, you know, we have all over the film and every single time we screen it, do not decide that you're going to go off any, any psychiatric drug abruptly. Do it really carefully and do it under the guidance of someone who knows and can help you. Maybe this would be a good time to let you tell us about any types of support groups that you know about. If people are out there and they, they want to get help from peers, uh, where can they go? My favorite would be the Inner Compass Initiative. They have a section of their website called the Withdrawal Project. And there's, there, there's no direct medical advice. It's very much an educational process. Like you have to learn about 
how slow is too slow or how slow should I go? Um, different kind of taper ways because there's compounding pharmacies that could help. How to talk to your doctor, how to read an FDA insert to understand like the side effects, what kind of symptoms may you experience if you come off. Uh, and then most importantly, like what do you do once you take that harm reduction approach and start getting down lower and lower? What kind of things can you use to cope and heal from um, the withdrawal and then learn how to use other tools to cope with mental health issues because you know it's not like they magically go away you know we still have human suffering and those kind of things so i would say the withdrawal project is my number one another good website is surviving antidepressants but on our website medicatingnormal.com we have all of them uh listed underneath a tab that says withdrawal so i would just uh direct listeners there and we'll link to those on our website, wmnf.org, if people want to uh, be able to find those easily. So we're speaking with Angie Peacock, who is a mental health advocate and decorated former Army sergeant. She's a subject, one of the subjects of the documentary Medicating Normal, which will be on PBS in the next month or two. It's also streaming on the PBS uh, app, so you can watch it there. We have, a, we have one of the directors and producers, Lynn Cunningham, with us as well. And we've gotten, you know, we're, we're, we're talking here now about doctors, about psychiatrists, and um, some of the things that maybe they're not doing so well when they're just prescribing things to, um, to their patients. What is it about doctors and psychiatrists? Um, what's, what might be some of the reasons why they, they don't really spend as much time talking about what the long-term side effects might be? Well, I think in our in our world of um, insurance reimbursement and um, many, many doctors are under so much stress to get as many people in the door and out, um, you know, there's the eight minute appointment and how how deeply can you actually probe someone's issues? So it, it, it almost becomes an economic thing where prescribing a drug is really the only thing in a toolbox because there's simply not the time. Um, and we've been told, um, you know, by many, many doctors that, you know, if you know that we live in a quick fix society, that there is a, the, a pill for every ill and um, um, what doctors, many doctors who want to put a slow, you know, slow down the process, um, they are doctor shopped away. If a, if a patient comes to them and doesn't get what they want, which is medication, because they've been told that it works, um, they'll go to another doctor. So there, there, we, we have, you know, empathy for these doctors um, and many don't have time to do the research required to know. Um, so I think doctors are under stress. Um, but I also think that, you know, they took an oath, do no harm, and there is harm out there. And um, we're really proud of, of, of some of the doctors who appear in our film because they have that humility to be able to say, I harmed my patients. I am harming them. I have harmed them. And they have what I think takes um, the single most important thing about being a doctor is the ability to listen to your patient. And so, um, you know, is eight minutes enough to really listen to a patient? I don't know. But um, I think this is the, these are all part of the problems that are out there. Maybe now would be a good time to look at the role of the pharmaceutical industry. So what can you tell us, uh, when, what you found in your film, Medicating Normal, Lynn, about uh, what the role of, of the pharmaceutical company was in this kind of explosion of these psychiatric drugs in maybe the 70s and, and 80s? Yeah, um, they became, you know, miracle drugs. And that was, um, you know, there was something called the chemical imbalance that we have found in our research. Bob Whitaker brings this up beautifully in a sort of historic look at how these drugs became so important and so central to the treatment of, quote, mental illness. Um, it's, it was, um, in fact, a sort of marketing slogan to try to explain and give rationale to why these drugs may be working. Oh, you have a chemical imbalance. These drugs will right that balance. And um, that is absolutely simply not true. It was, it was used as a marketing device to make sense of the whole thing. And um, there are many, many in, in Bob Whitaker's research, he points out and digs into many of the studies on these drugs that are not favorable, that do not show efficacy, do not show safety, 
but they don't need to be published. They're unpublished studies. Not every study uh, uh, on a drug has to be published and the FDA doesn't require that. And so drugs with two favorable studies can get passed by the FDA. And there could be 20 negative studies on, a, on any given drug. So, um, you know, everyone knows the pharmaceuticals role is to sell drugs. Um, it's just, there is not the, the, it's not transparent about the real impact of these drugs. I want to remind people that that's the voice of Lynn Cunningham. She is a filmmaker. She's the director and producer of Medicating Normal, which will be shown on PBS and is available now on the PBS streaming app. And Angie Peacock, we also have on the line, who's a mental health advocate and decorated former Army Sergeant. This is WMNF's Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. We are talking about the, the new documentary called Medicating Normal. Some of these drugs cause damage to the nervous system if they're used long term. Uh, give us some examples of that, please. Well, from my own personal experience, I have a vestibular disorder now. I have visual changes that have happened. Um, just overall, I feel like a heightened sense of anxiety all the time. Uh, they call it protracted withdrawal syndrome, but I don't think that's a very accurate term because I'm not in withdrawal anymore. You know, I haven't had a drug in six years. So, but it does have this lasting impact. But Every doctor I go to, you know, they just don't think this is a thing. There's no way that medication could have affected you like that. Um, but th the truth is that we just don't know. We know that you take a drug long term and you take several of them in combination, that there is no research to show what they do long term or what they do when you come off after long term use. So I, I definitely still live with some disabilities that are extremely hard to deal with. What were you told when you were initially prescribed these medications? When you saw the doctor, what did the doctor say? I mean, nothing. It was just like, take this pill. It's going to help you feel better. That was really it. I don't think I've ever, um, you know, a lot of people try to say like, well, you were a veteran, so this is a VA problem. No, I saw civilian pro providers also. Not once when I was prescribed any medication was it like, we call it informed consent, which just means like you're explained the risks, the benefits, and the alternatives. And like, here's the side effects, and here's how we're going to come off of it, and this is how long you're going to take it. I never had a discussion like that. That was never, that was never a thing. Um, so I, I knew what the term addiction meant. I knew like, okay, if I run out of pills early, or if I am taking more than I should, or I feel euphoria, or I buy them on the street, like then maybe I'm addicted. But that never happened to me because there was just, I was just taking like one pill a day, just the way the doctor said. So I, I knew like to look out for addiction, but this was an addiction, you know. That's Angie Peacock, who is a army, former army sergeant and also now a mental health advocate. We also have Lynn Cunningham, who's director and producer of Medicating Normal, a new, a new film. This isn't just a problem that affects veterans. This is um, 7 million children, I'm reading, under the age of 18, take prescribed psychiatric drugs every day. So these you know, I, I, I think you can, we can all visualize how it's um, painful enough for, a, for an adult to go through the things that you're describing, but what, how, how in the world are they, are we just prescribing it to, to that many children? Yeah, and um, I have uh, college age kids who report back that it is, it's rampant on every college campus around the country. And um, it's just, it's not even, it's the norm. And that's what's really upsetting is that should it really be the norm and the go-to? And I think Angie said before, you know, there are these, these campaigns out, go, if you're feeling sad, if you're feeling unsettled in any way as a young person, seek out a doctor. And um, true, we want young people to seek help. That is absolutely not what we're trying to say. But if seeking out a doctor leads immediately to um, a prescription for a medication that often lasts years and years and years, is that what we really want for our, our young people? But yeah. Yeah. The, the, the young person that you followed in the film, their parents were kind of like, you know, our, 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 our uh, child had been moving and was a little sad. And so we took her to a counselor and we thought that, they, that we'd be just talking things out. And then all of a sudden, boom, there's a prescription for one of these psychiatric drugs. And it really took the father by surprise that, that, it, that it happened so easily and so quickly. Yeah. And, and these are very engaged parents. These are academics who are very involved. They just had one child. 
um, they are, if, if it's difficult for that family to figure out what's going on, imagine, you know, the foster care system where kids don't have parents who are checking in and, and caring about how they're responding to drugs. Um, so it, it's a, it's a huge thing. And, um, they, it took great courage for Rebecca's parents to actually push back on the system and say, wait a minute. And, um, they, 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 you know, Todd describes it was almost humiliating bringing up the possibility was like, well, could the drugs be causing this? And um, yeah, so that that that's why we think Rebecca was an excellent uh, case study for the film. And every time the father asked that, or at least the first several times, uh, that com question was completely brushed off. Yeah, yeah, very, very, very upsetting for him. So Angie and Lynn, uh, I think we'll wrap up soon, but I do want to uh, get some final thoughts. What are, what are some things we haven't talked about yet in this conversation that you think that people should know about psychiatric medications, about addiction, about overprescription, and uh, especially when it comes to veterans? Do either of you have any more thoughts that you can share? Well, I want to point out one, one thing, because we talk a lot about withdrawal, and we talk about the fact that these drugs cause physical dependency. And um, as a team, we've become really sensitive to using the term, these drugs are addictive. Um, what we really mean is that these drugs cause a physiological dependency. They, you know, they change your brain and they often require more and more of the same amount to achieve the result that they started with. So it acts like um, a, an addiction. It isn't, as Angie explained earlier, you are basically following the drug, the doctor's orders and taking the drug as prescribed. But um, when you wanna get off of it, there you are left with this really debilitating withdrawal um, that can be very, very harmful. So that I just wanted to point out when you say the word addiction, um, you have to be careful of that. And then from my point of view, I would just say, you know, to seek out any different choices that could be less harmful when you have a mental health struggle. I, it, it, and I know the suffering is so real. And when we say medicating normal, we don't want to, don't want to diminish that the suffering is not severe and debilitating and that people are experiencing huge tragedy and loss and trauma that, that makes you want to take something to take it all away. You know, so I would just say, before you take that first pill, to read the pamphlet, to really do your due diligence, to um, talk to your pharmacist, to keep a, keep a diary. This is how I felt before I took the medication. This is how I felt at one week, at two weeks, at three weeks, um, to really ask the questions that I didn't ask, you know, to your doctor, like, how long am I going to take this? What are some of the side effects? Um, even, and I want to bring that point too, even the side effects that are listed in the pamphlet, they were very much downplayed. Like it says dizziness. And I thought, oh, I'll be lightheaded when I get out of bed. Like no big deal. It'll be fine. No, the dizziness that I experienced, I couldn't take a shower standing up for two years. Like it's severe. It's not, you know, and we think it doesn't happen to me. It won't, it won't happen to me. So just, you just have to explore all these things. You have to be an informed consumer. You have to educate yourself. You are your best advocate. And then in that same vein, it's that you are not broken, that just because you have mental health struggles, it doesn't mean that you're a weak person or that there's something wrong with you. So if there's people along your path that tell you that you're broken and you're going to take this medication for the rest of your life, and you're always going to have these problems, that is just not true. And there is ways to heal. There's ways to cope with these hard things that we're all dealing with um, outside of the mental health care system. There's friends, there's nutrition, there's, you know, community support, there's community service, there's supplements there's all kinds of things that you can try acupuncture cranio i could just go on and on and on and maybe sometimes those things help for a bit and then you have to change it up and find something else that helps uh, but i would just encourage everybody to just try everything you can to cope with those things to talk it out with a good friend um, before you jump on medication for life well i want to thank you both for joining me on wmnf's tuesday cafe to speak about the new film the new documentary medicating normal thanks so much angie and lynn thanks sean thank you